The Hiroshima mission went exactly as briefed and planned. It was a dream mission. Sunday, December the 7th, the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, and bright and early Monday morning, I went downtown and enlisted as an aviation cadet. Uh, downtown Baltimore? Baltimore. I enlisted as an aviation cadet uh, to take training in uh, communications. And I got sworn in that day and then ordered back home to await the formation of a class. And that didn't come until June. And in June, I left Baltimore and went to Scott Field in uh, Belleville, Illinois, right near St. Louis, where I had my training as an aviation cadet. And uh, I was commissioned a second lieutenant communications officer in the Air Force. However, I uh, performed so well at that school that I was given no option for assignment, I was uh, assigned to uh, go to Harvard and MIT to advance electronics. And not having good sense, I protested. I didn't want to do that. I just left Hopkins. And I had a particular reason for not wanting to do it, which I explained to them. And I'll explain to you in a moment. So they, uh, they, they, uh, vacated my spot and gave it to somebody else, and they sent me to Boca Raton, Florida for field training in uh, radar, airborne radar. The name of the game was, if I had gone to Harvard and MIT, <coughs> it was a highly theoretical uh, and a design engineering type school uh, that they had established, and it was a uh, minimum one-year course, and I didn't want to wait a year. I had family that was being consumed in the Holocaust in Germany. And uh, I had a particular reason for wanting to do damage to the Heimat. Well, anyhow, I finished the, uh, the uh, uh, airborne radar training at Boca Raton in uh, January of 43, fully expecting to go from there to, to the UK and join the 8th Air Force that was forming. Uh, I was given sealed orders and put on a trailways bus going north in Florida and told not to open the orders until the bus got underway. They didn't want us talking to the people at the school. Turned out we were assigned to Orlando, Florida to the School of Applied Tactics. Now this was a center that was established to be uh, a training school for cadres uh, of new operational units that were being formed. And uh, one of the requisites for being on the faculty was that you have had some combat experience. But I had none and uh, didn't seem to bother anybody. But uh, I worked with some uh, RAF types when I first got there. I was brought up to speed in a hurry. And I began teaching there. Well, I was uh, very unhappy about <clears throat> that whole situation. I wanted out. I wanted to, as I say, get to Europe. I went up to Washington, to the Pentagon, to see what I could do to get myself transferred to Europe. I wanted to go where my classmates were. All the, all the fellows who got operational assignments were, most of them were in Europe. Some went to the Pacific. Well, I had no problem getting the interview with, with the general because my father's friend was a, a very astute politician. And uh, he said, fine, there's no problem. Uh, just have a seat in the outer office and we'll get your records and see what we can do for you. So I had a seat and about a half hour later, the sergeant major comes back with my jacket folder. In the basement of the Pentagon, they had a, 15 million folders, you know, everybody's records were there then. And believe me, they had them. I was amazed that, uh, you know, it took the guy a half hour with a uh, manual retrieval system. It was not all automated like it is today. He uh, 
went in to see the general, and I see they got their heads together and they're shaking him, and then I got waved into the office. And uh, General Ulio said to me, he says, son, I don't understand this. He said, but your records have been flagged, and even I can't touch you. So this was a tip-off that something was in the wind. And he said, I suggest that you go back to your station, and it'll all come out in the wash in due time. So I was a little disappointed, but I went back to Orlando. And uh, when I got back there, I decided there's more than one way of skinning a cat. They were forming a cadre to go to B-29s, the new super bomber. And they were going to take the ninth bomb group, which was our demonstration group at the school where I taught, and they were going to build the cadre from that. Now, the, the commanding officer of that unit was a good friend of mine, and he had been in the Philippines early on in the war and left and went to Australia, and they fought their way back up to Java in a few places, and then he was brought back to the States. And I told him that, you know, I wanted out of this school. I, I'd had it. And I thought it was partial. I was one of two people on the faculty that had no combat experience. And here I'm teaching combat tactics to people. So he didn't disagree with me. And he says, well, let's see what we can do. It was a paperwork transfer at the school to move me into his organization. OK? So nothing had to go to Washington. So nothing was seen in the Pentagon, and I got moved into the 9th Bomb Group. And then when a blanket order came down to move the 9th Bomb Group to B-29 training, it was just a blanket order, and, and the, and the uh, names were filled in at the school. So nobody in the Pentagon knew at that point that I was now moved out of the school and was taking steps in the direction of going to the Pacific. This uh, suited me very well because, uh, A, I like new things, and the B-29 was a new challenge. Uh, at the school, I had experience in B-17s and uh, B-24s, Liberators, and uh, uh, Vega Venturas. We flew patrol aircraft. We flew bombers. I flew night fighters. I, uh, I was a night fighter instructor for a little while. So I got transferred to the 393rd. And about a week or 10 days later, there's a freeze order comes down from Washington. Nobody in, nobody out of the 393rd. And prepare for a movement for temporary duty to Wendover Army Airfield, Utah. Now, the order itself was a total surprise. The fact that it also ordered us to go complete with organizational equipment. And initially, it didn't authorize uh, dependents to go. But before we left, that was changed. That was a tip off that we were never coming back to the, to the old group. Why was that place selected in Utah? Why not? Because it was remote. <laughs> and, and if a stranger came along, he had to be crazy or wanted something. <laughs> It was a sorry place, but anyhow, that's where we went. And uh, I was there uh, less than a week when uh, Paul Tibbetts called an assembly in the theater one morning, introduced himself, and he told us we were gonna, he was going to be our new commanding officer and uh, that we were not going back to our unit, that we were forming a, a new unit that will be designed to operate independently anywhere in the world to use a new weapon still in development that if it works will uh, could very well bring about a hasty conclusion of the war. Did you know anything but about But don't ask what it is because if you do you're going to get punished. Just trust me. And with that he said everybody can go on 10 day or two week leave with the exception of Lieutenant Beezer, and I'd like you in my office in 15 minutes. Now, Klassen came to get me out of that crowd because he knew uh, what was going to go on up in the colonel's office. And he made 
damn sure that I got out of the fatigues that I was wearing and put on a class A uniform and had my hair combed and, you know, looked like something other than a desert rat. And uh, I went up there uh, at the appointed time, and I was ushered into the colonel's office, and there was a group of men seated in a semicircle, and I was put at the center of the thing, and it was damned obvious that I was going to be <laughs> questioned or interviewed for something. And that's exactly what it was. Uh, it was an interview by a group of men from I didn't know where at that time. I later was told where they were from. Uh, they uh, asked me things like, you know, uh, where'd you go to school? What's your background? What kind of jobs have you had since you came in the service? What have you done? And this one fellow looks me square in the eye. He was Dr. Uh, Hal Brody of University of California. At least that's what his name tag said, and it turned out he was. He said, uh, how do you feel about flying combat? Well, I had silver wings. I was rated. And I said, that's what I was trained to do. I have no feelings one way or another about it. He said, that's good. He said, uh, we're considering you for a job that will require that. He said, we have people that can do the job but in our group, but they're too valuable to risk. So <laughs> I could see my life expectancy going down, my insurance going up. So I shrugged my shoulders and didn't say anything. I said, to me, it was no problem. It was uh, obvious that uh, I was being interviewed for a job at that point. Then I was excused from the room. I was told, don't leave the outer office. They closed the doors. And I couldn't hear what was going on. But in a few minutes, the doors open, and they're all laughing, and they're jovial. And everybody's putting their hands out, welcome to the club. Nobody's told me anything yet. What club? But there was a Navy officer, a lieutenant commander, Dick Ashworth. He put his arm around the shoulders and he said, uh, I'm going to be your guardian angel for a little while and introduce you to, around. Uh, you'll find out in a little while what it's all about. And with that uh, began a whole series of events and things that led up to my accompanying the weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When did you know uh, about the bomb? As part of my indoctrination, they took me to Los Alamos. I went to, I got on the airplane to go to Los Alamos. It was a uh, DC-3, and I was with a, uh, a fellow named uh, Henderson, Arthur Henderson, who was the pilot. And he asked me to sit in the right seat to do the flaps and wheels for him and help him which I had done with him many times before. Well, just before I got on the airplane, a security man got a hold of me, and they took all Air Force insignia off my uniform, and they put the castles of the Corps of Engineers on. And as we're running down the runway to take off, Henderson says to me, hey, I thought you were in the Air Force. I said, I was up until a few minutes ago. <laughs> I said, where are we going? He says, I really don't know, but we'll get clearance from uh, flight service, Salt Lake City, shortly. In the meantime, we're just going to loiter between here and Salt Lake City. And uh, we were cleared to go to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Well, that was a small civilian field, and uh, I didn't know what it was all about. We got in there, there was a staff car waiting, and Ashworth and Tibbetts and myself were taken up to Los Alamos. And there, a whole new world unfolded for me. Uh, I met all the right people. I was given an assignment. I did some work on a project. Nobody ever came out and said, this is what we're developing. But having just come off a first-rate campus, names like Niels Bohr, Rangbells, Enrico Fermi, uh, and that. So I just put two and two together. I said, they're going to split at them somehow or other and uh, release a lot of energy. And then uh, the people that I worked very closely with after that on the project, uh, they knew 
those that were up on the hill at Los Alamos, they knew. And slowly but surely, it, it gets fed to you by inference and innuendo. And um, I think it was done deliberately because they, they made a determination that until the doctor said otherwise, I would fly with everyone they uh, would drop. And I got in on the terminal phases of the development of the proximity devices that detonated the weapon. As you know, they wanted it to explode over the ground. Uh, a lot of reasons for that, most of them related to the physics of the explosion and its potential for damage. So that uh, I, I ran a flight test program for them independent of the weapon and then we put it in dummy shapes and we dropped it and we tracked it and had spotting charges. And we had nine good drops and uh, Admiral Parsons says that's enough. And I argued with him, I said, sir, I don't have any statistically significant data yet. He says, I don't have time to wait for that. I have a readiness date to meet. But I had nine out of nine work. Going back to the time when, <clears throat> when you dropped the bomb, what kind of impression did it get? Now that, you know, this is, this is the thing, Shell, it's funny because I was on an airplane that did this and I never saw anything until it was all over. I was busy working in the back of the aircraft where there was no windows. And once the bomb left the airplane, that's when I was busiest. Coming in, I was doing a survey of the electronic environment to make sure there was nothing there that was going to interfere with the with a device and, and or prematurely detonate it. And then once it left the aircraft to fall, then I was busy monitoring its functioning. So when, um, when he dropped it, he uh, went into this escape maneuver and the G-forces had me sort of pinned to the floor. I was sitting on the floor. And when I got to the window, I never saw the intact city of Hiroshima. What I saw of course, the mushroom cloud had come up beyond our flight level by then, and this thing was, uh, it, it was just defied description. I just didn't know the words at that time to describe it. And I looked down and I saw all this crud and corruption down there with new fires continually bursting on the periphery. This firestorm had gotten started, had a good start, and uh, this thing was just spreading. And, and at 30,000 feet, to be able to watch it spread, you know it was going fast because the relative motion uh, 30,000 feet is very little. It's there, but you're going over the ground maybe 180 miles an hour or something, but uh, that's slow. So that uh, there was no question in my mind that this thing had uh, done a tremendous job and that uh, that city was mortally wounded. The uh, impact of the, uh, the direct reflected shock wave and the uh, bounce shock wave, I, I've read many descriptions of it. My own impression of it was that it was no worse than flak rattling the skin of the aircraft. The Hiroshima mission went exactly as briefed and planned. It was a dream mission. We met all of our objectives, time-wise, and everything. And no problems. Uh, Nagasaki mission was a screw-up from the start. We got off the ground late. And uh, one of the subjects that I, I, I just barely touch on it in the book was uh, the uh, status of the airplane itself. And to convince myself that, and to really find the truth, I went to the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, where they have that airplane on display, and they have all the records of that airplane, the engineering records. And I searched, and I got copies of the engineering records for a couple of days before that mission and a couple of days after. And that airplane had a fuel transfer system that was uh, sort of a bad actor. But the cure was just turn it on and forget about it, leave it on. And eventually it will come on and transfer the fuel. 
Well, the weather was bad going up. The weather forecast was a bust. There was a low pressure trough laying right along our flight line, and it was stormy, and it was rough. One airplane missed his rendezvous, so we hung around 45 minutes waiting for him, which was a mistake because he took off with a potential fuel problem, fuel shortage. Had 600 gallons in the bomb bay that he wasn't sure he was going to get. So he's running through this storm and uh, they missed that rendezvous. We get up to Kokura, which was the brief target. Kokura lay downwind of uh, Yawada which was the Pittsburgh of Japan in those days, and Iwata had been firebombed two nights before. Kokura was downwind of that target, and the dust and debris was still coming down from the fires at Iwata. Now, at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, the sun angle was such that the bombardier, from his brief approach, could not make out his aiming point due to the backscatter from that stuff. So we made three passes at that target. All the while, the throttles up against the stops burning 900 gallons an hour. We screwed around over that target one hour. We now have on our hands a loaded weapon, an airplane with not enough fuel showing to get anywhere home not enough to get back to Iwo Jima. What do you do with this bomb on board? The third pass, they began to shoot at us. We were taking flak, and I heard fighters coming. And I notified the cockpit that I heard this fighter activity on my search receiver, and I was told, don't bother me. About that time, the tail gunner sees them coming up. He says, here they come. So we took off. In the process of taking off, oh, before, just before we took off, the pilot and the flight engineer get into an academic discussion. The flight engineer wanted to throw the switches on like he was told, and hopefully the fuel would transfer. And he was told to do as I say. I'm flying the airplane. Turn those switches off. Being a good soldier, he was a master sergeant, he turned the switches off. And the fuel shortage is becoming more acute by the minute. As we were breaking away from Kokura, the pilot pushed at what he thought was his interphone button on the yoke to ask the co-pilot, uh, where is uh, uh, Freddie Bach, the other airplane that made the rendezvous and was with us. Instead, he had pushed his radio button and at that point, the airplane that missed the rendezvous comes on, Chuck, where the hell are you? He was still milling around <laughs> off the coast of, uh, uh, not too far from Okinawa. We made a decision that with the weather briefing we had gotten and the weather report we got from Nagasaki, we would probably would have to make a radar run. This we were briefed not to do. Uh, Ashworth, a Navy officer, who was with us. Uh, he was the project, senior project man, uh, speaking for General Groves, said, I will take the responsibility. We will make a radar run and unload this thing over Nagasaki. We cut right across Kyushu. And we cut across every fighter base that the Japanese had activated to resist the invasion that they knew had to come. So we were in, in real hostile country all the way. And we embarked on a radar run to Nagasaki. And the last 15 seconds, I heard the bombardiers say, I've got a hole, I see it, bombs away. And he dropped. And we went into the escape maneuver, and the thing went off, and it went off so well it cleared out every cloud in the sky <laughs> over that area, <laughs> as well as cleaning out the city. But we got three shockwaves. 
If we had bombed where we were supposed to bomb, we would have gotten two. They postulated immediately we had missed the target by about three miles. We probably hit in the Yurikami Valley. Then we, we decided we had to get out of there, and we were going to go off the coast and head straight for uh, Okinawa in a controlled glide to conserve fuel. But we were prepared to ditch, and after the bomb drop, we notified Air Sea Rescue. When we returned to the Okinawa area, they were taking aboard these liberators. Uh, he called them on the radio. I don't know whether he used the proper signal instruction or not, but nobody answered. He put out a mayday, nobody answered. So then he told the navigator to fire the flare pistol. And now how he told him and what he told him, I don't know. All I know is all of a sudden smoke came pouring out of the floorboards and I went tearing into the floor looking for a piece of my equipment down there that might have caught fire. That's all we didn't need at that point. But as I was removing the floorboard, one of the other fellows in the back there with me tugged on my sleeve and said they fired a flare pistol up front. Well, somebody in that landing pattern saw the big bird firing every color of the rainbow and decided this guy's in trouble and he peeled off and the rest of them just played follow the leader and they peeled off so we could get in. We came in long and hot. He didn't warn anybody. And just as he flared, the two inboard engines stalled, starved, out of fuel. We get to the end of the runway where there's a 90 degree turn. He's still doing 100 miles an hour. He doesn't say hang on or anything. He just kicked it around. <laughs> and I almost went through the side of the airplane. But we were on the ground and we were safe, and so all is forgiven, and, but not forgotten. There are certain questions that are asked wherever I go. Are you sorry? No. Do you have any regrets? No. Uh, would you do it again? And the answer to that is given the same circumstances. I guess the question is rather meaningless to ask. What would have happened if the bombs wouldn't have been dropped? Would that be a... Well, this is, this is the other observation I get all the time. Thank you. Thank God for the bomb. You saved my life. And these were the fellows that were being transferred from Europe to the Pacific, fellows who were already in the staging areas in the Pacific, ready to leap into Japan people who saw the Japanese fight to the death. They never surrendered in those islands. They just went till they, there weren't enough of them left. Like in Iwo Jima. Yeah. Iwo Jima, Okinawa, any of the, Tarawa, any of the islands, you name it. Guadalcanal. Look at New Guinea, how many years they fought in the jungles there. So that uh, it would have been a bloodbath. The solution to the problem is not being sorry for what has already happened but individually and collectively dedicate ourselves to the eradication of the causes of war and war itself. Work together as human beings to achieve the kind of world that we all idealistically seek. This is Dundalk Community College, Cable 6.